I myself too have like healed myself through food and people just like don't know that they're poisoning themselves from within and like just consuming like so many wrong things that aren't right for them and like when you end up cooking the things they should be having and like you see them transform like you said and they're happier they're healthier they're more energized they have more pep in their step like you did that so you feel pride and like helping someone achieve that this episode is brought to you by fultonfishmarket.com the most trusted name in seafood fultonfishmarket.com is the e-commerce provider for new york's iconic fulton fish market the largest seafood market in the western hemisphere trusted by top chefs for over 200 years Fulton Fish Market provides a range of world-class seafood options. FultonFishMarket.com can help you serve a wide range of customers, whether you serve high-profile individuals or just strive for culinary excellence. They deliver directly to your doorstep in all 48 contiguous states, providing a comprehensive selection of the finest seafood, from wild fish to caviar and shellfish. When it comes to seafood, FultonFishMarket.com is our go-to destination and the name we trust. Let's celebrate those who support us and dive into this episode of the Private Chef Podcast with a taste of excellence and freshness. Visit www.fultonfishmarket.com to get 15% of your first order. Use code PRIVATECHEF at checkout. Welcome to the Private Chef Podcast, serving the 1%. I'm your host, Hannes Hedgey. And on our show, we speak to the best chefs, how they honed in on their skills to excel in the industry and what it takes to work as a private chef for some of the most exclusive clients in the world. Welcome back to the Private Chef Podcast. I'm your host, Hannes Henchy. I'm excited to introduce the talented health chef, Julia Cipator. She is an award-winning chef and TV personality known for winning shows like Food Network's Jobbed and Kitchen Crash, as well as Alex vs. America. Julia is a culinary expert who creates innovative recipes and contributes to various media outlets. She also designs personalized meal plans for clients with specific requests and dietary restrictions, including celebrities like Jason Biggs and Andy Cohn. Julia's expertise extends to developing recipes for publication and serving as a wellness consultant. Join us for an exciting conversation about food, health, and wellness. Thank you for making time, Julia. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, of course. So where did your culinary journey start? Um, I don't even know where to begin with that, but <laughs> I guess it started with me and my grandmother. She was an amazing cook. She was actually a cook in Ukraine. Um, and growing up as a kid, I would make fermented cabbage and pickled tomatoes and just like all of this very traditional food that we always had in the house. Um, and then I kind of grew up in the restaurant industry with my family. So we were definitely eating kale and, and collard greens and cauliflower before it was cool. And my stepdad, actually, his mom was diagnosed with lymphoma, stage four, um, and he quit his job and he moved to the Berkshires, to the Cushy Institute. And it's this vegan, macrobiotic, hippie institution. And they actually went fully macro, fully vegan, lived there for a few months, learned how to create fermented foods and just like eat very clean within this uh, macrobiotic diet, I should say. And she actually went into remission and lived for four more years after completely going vegan and macrobiotic. And in her memory, he opened Organic Grill, which we've now had for 23 years in Manhattan. Wow. That's the story. Yeah. And then <laughs> I got burnt out from the restaurant industry and gave myself shingles. And told my parents that I needed like six months off and I needed to figure out where I needed to go, where the next journey in this food spectrum was. And I went to this women's networking event. I had no idea what I was going to do. I had no idea who was there. And I started talking to these girls. One thing led to another. And they, by going to more of these events, they convinced me that I should become a private chef. And I was like, oh, I don't want to do that. I just came out of the restaurant world. Like, Chefs make no money. That sounds terrible. 
And they're like, no, what are you talking about? You can make a lot of money. And I listened to them, went home that weekend, made a Squarespace website. And my first client ended up being Ryan Seacrest. Wait, how, how did Ryan find the website? One of his assistants, someone, and sent them, sent it to me and, or sent it to them. And I got reached out to by a personal assistant. Wow. See, this is actually the power of the internet. I, I mean, Absolutely. I, I keep, I keep harping on that every other day or so, but we are now in a day and age where there is less, less, so it's still there, but there's less gatekeeping in our industry. Like I see principals sitting on their couch, scrolling through Instagram feeds of chefs, which could be a direct connection to them, you know, and then there is websites and uh, blogs. And so, well, that, even look at the love shack, fancy chef. I, forget, yeah. I don't know her exact Instagram, something with fork in her handle, but she's gone viral and TikTok famous, but it's also because her principal is a famous fashion designer that's also posting about her. So like, huh, it goes, like that helps. now it's like, now it's like the brands are also into this private chef scene and world and, and want to be seen in this light on Instagram. Yeah. That, there is, I mean, there, I, I guess the most famous version is, uh, Chef K from the Kardashians. Yeah. Or I was going to say actually Chef Bay, the one that just like goes to all the celebrities and makes videos with them on her TikTok. It is like the queen of Erwan. <laughs> like I'm obsessed. Like I love it. So you're active on TikTok? No, I try to be. I make like one video and I'm like, oh, I'm exhausted. But um, I try to be. I need to keep up. I need to post. But it's also just, difficult in our industry because I think with social media, we compare ourselves to everyone else. Everyone mm. else's food is readily visible, available. They have more followers. They did this, they had that. And I feel like it could be overwhelming and mm. it's not for everyone. And I just feel like it's very difficult to be in this very isolated private chef world and then constantly compare yourself to others. Mm. Yeah, it's a lone wolf industry. And then you yeah. get sucked into your phone while you're in your break in the parking lot of the grocery shop. Mm -hmm. Or while you're cooking and then you're not recording. And you're like, why can't I record while I'm cooking? And then you feel uncomfortable because it's you're in your client's home and maybe they don't want you to be recording. And it's just, also, it's just a lot. Being Having to cook while recording is very difficult. The other day I was speaking to a chef who's also a creator and he, and he has a, a YouTube channel. And um, so he actually is at a point where if the client doesn't allow him to record, if it's like a temporary gig or something, he doesn't even take the gig anymore. Wow. So he's making so much money from the social media side no, of things. No, no, no. He's not, he's not making so much money. It's just, um, so his, I think his core earnings are still in cooking. It's, mm -hmm. ju it's just that if he takes temporary work, that at least he wants to be able to make videos around Make it. content. Yeah. Okay. I don't necessarily know if I agree with that, but does he live in New York or just <laughs> no, somewhere else? Actually, he doesn't, he doesn't have a home. He's like a road warrior. He's doing a lot of yachting. and. So oh. Yeah. I find that very, very interesting. Cool. Like he, he, yeah. Uh, I've, actually, I've, to some degree, I've done that for some time. But I don't, I don't think I was would... a yacht chef as well for like, oh, I did it for a week. I'm not going to lie. And I was, this is not for me. <laughs> no, thank you. It's very different, like right? Very different. Very, very fun. Very beautiful. But I mean, there's something again, like I said about being, uh, this is a very exhausting, very lonely job. So you need to like create some sort of like normalcy to be happy. And like, I need a routine. I like my apartment. I like my workout classes. Like, I'm also very spoiled that my clients have lived 15 minutes away from me for five years now. So I have a very convenient um, commute to work. Yeah. I, I, but I think that's the way to go in New York. Like with my last client, I like, okay, this is where they live. I literally try to get the closest apartment. Like it was like a seven mm -hmm. minute walk. And I was like, this is amazing because now you can have a life around this. And like, if there's exactly. a break, it's close enough. You can jump on a bicycle and go home. Yeah. Yeah. I have an Uber, but yes, or a city bike, but yes. <laughs> so 
how was that transition for you? Highly skilled restaurant chef on the edge of burnout, feeling like there is no money in cooking. I, I can relate to all of that. When I first came to New York, I felt the same way. But then how did you make sense of the private service or the private chef world without really knowing about it? So you had your first client. How, how did you know how to value your time and the service? I think years of being in the restaurant world, front of house, really also helped me to become a private chef. I knew how to talk to the client. I knew how to yes. plate the food. I knew how to, you know, place the plate, how to set the table. So, you know, I feel like learning the front of house knowledge, having the back of house knowledge, having, um, you know, the experience of running both is what allows you to then be a right, like a, a good private chef, because you need to have that personal rapport with people. As much as your food could be amazing, your personality could suck and it could completely be a turnoff for the client. Like I, sometimes I joke around that like my clients love me more than the food. Like I think they just want to like me to come over and hang out with them more so than they need to eat my food. I, I think that's true. <laughs> It's like they're like uh, you become their therapist, you become their uh, confidant, their best friend, their you know um, stylist. You know how many times they come out? Should I wear this or should I wear this? And you're like mixing something in a bowl. <laughs> I, I think there is a there there's truth to that, you know. And, and I think in a private environment, the personality can truly carry your career. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Um, and I think the, the way that I navigated it was like, right. My first client was Ryan Seacrest and I undervalued myself. I'd also just say this cause I didn't sign an NDA. <laughs> so, um, like I undervalued myself. I like did like a very low day rate. I thought it was so much money. And then I, it was like 12 hour days and I was miserable, miserable, like couldn't, didn't have a day off on Sundays. Sometimes he'd be flying and you'd have to do this and then you do that. And I was like, Oh my God. Okay. Noted. I never want to be a private chef for one person nonstop. Like great. Had this experience, did this for six months. Noted. Not exactly the fit for me. And then I was like, okay, well maybe I just want meal prep clients. And then I just like bounced around and set my schedule where I had meal prep clients three days a week. And I was like, okay, this is cool. But like you tap yourself out eventually. And then I was like, Hmm, next I started getting like a lot of like celebrities, but not every day. So I was like, hmm, maybe I should get a commissary kitchen and cook out of a commissary. Tried that out. Huge mistake, awful, miserable, never, never, not for me. It works so well for some business models, but it just wasn't my ideal. Um, it's also huge overhead and then, in and New York. And this was like huge overhead in New York. Exactly. And, um, you know, then I started doing maybe like uh, some health coaching stuff. I started doing this. I started doing that. And then finally, like the perfect clients fell into my lap. Um, I got this amazing man on the Upper East Side. He was a lawyer, like divorced, lived with his son. We became so close. I was the only person at his wedding that wasn't his child. His daughter is now my best friend. Like we're in, he moved to South Carolina. He got married and moved, but like it's such an important part of my life. Like love the man so much. And then I got a couple in Nolita. Um, and now they're in the Lower East Side. I've been with them. They got married. They're going to have a family. Like I've been with them through COVID. I cook for the entire family and it's three days a week and it's the perfect schedule because it allows me to also try out, you know, auditioning for shows or doing events or a dinner party here and there, or maybe testing out a different formula for my business or recording a podcast on days that I don't have to cook. So it's really given me an amazing flexibility of having a full-time clientele three days a week and then two days a week having the opportunity to do other things. I can relate to that. So I found that also my food, the delivery and the appreciation is better if it's a little bit less, you know, like if you work five, six days a week, I, I think on six days, kind of my breaking point. And then sometimes when there's holidays and people push me into two weeks, like I can't wait to, you know, just get out. A hundred percent. So I, I, I'll say yes, like 10 days in a destination, right? Like my clients go to Bermuda sometimes. And I'm like, yes, I'll go after day 10 of like 
not stop working. You're like, I can't do this anymore. I I need to recharge. I need to go lay down. This is too much. Um, now, now the yacht chef will just be laughing at us because they're like, oh, I'm in an eight, eight oh, or ten week rotation or they do the whole season. And yeah, I like, couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. I could never even do the whole season in the Hamptons. It's too much. It's too much in the Hamptons. The, the parties, the, yeah. It's, I, I did one weekend for this when I just started. Um, one weekend in the Hamptons. And she told me, she was like, oh, maybe it's going to be 20 people buffet. It ended up being like 100 people. And I ended up flipping burgers for everyone. I mean, it was perfect. The party went out epically, but I was exhausted. I've never had more meat juices on me at once. Um, but yeah. Also, it's really funny if I look back to the things that I would say yes to when I was 27 versus now. I'm like, how did I do that? Like, I would never be able to do that now. But I like now feel, if I don't have like... a cart that's going to help me like get there, I'm like, I could carry this? My back. <laughs> I feel like in that age, we're just kind of uh, invincible mindset or like... Mm -hmm. I think now I'm a lot more cautious. I, I try to be more predictive of what's going on. And, but I'm also a little bit more choosy. I'm trying to prevent mm -hmm. those crazy things. But yeah. I think well, in I our mid-20s, yes going... we just push through it because we, we want the 100%. work, we want the job, we want the paycheck. I said yes to going to Aspen and ended up skiing with my clients, breaking my shoulder and cooked the whole way through. Like, didn't say anything. Like, no sling, no nothing. And... It took me like two years to recover from the ski, from, from the broken shoulder. But I was just like, how did I do that? Like, I don't know if I would have done that now. Like, I don't know if I would have even had the strength to do that now. Do you, I hope you don't have any lasting injury because you didn't immediately get medical attention. I did go to the doctor, the hospital right away. Okay. Um, but it was like a, it's like a tear that they couldn't put a cast on. Okay. So like, I just had to like be in a sling. Yeah. But like I would take the sling off to cook. So there's no long lasting anything. It was just a very long healing process because That's I wasn't I've been there. necessarily <laughs> I was in a oh, household. I, you know, careful. I was in a household where they had marble staircase and they uh usually I wouldn't I wouldn't wear shoes in there in that particular mm -hmm. area just because it, it, it made more noise. So when I was serving and I was walking up, I hit my right foot so hard that I broke my uh, toe and, and the, the principal heard it. It heard that it was like a poof. But at the same time, they didn't bother to ask. So I just cooked through the whole night with a broken toe. Mm -hmm. And then like the next morning, which also happened to be, I think was like the last work day. And then I, I was anyway on vacation for two weeks. And then the next morning I went to the doctor and, and it was a broken toe. And then I obviously had to tell the assistant that I got... I had a broken toe, mm -hmm. but I also said, like, I, I don't think it's going to affect my working schedule. I'll just be back in two weeks. But they're like, that's kind of random that you broke your toe on the staircase. <laughs> oh, yeah. They don't like, what do you mean? Yeah. Like, oh, you broke your shoulder skiing? That's weird. Yeah. But I mean, I, I think you feel responsible. No, you signed up for the gig. You're supposed to cook. And, Absolutely. And 100%. then you're like, I can't pull out of that. No. You put skin in the game, like your reputation is on the line. So like I could never. Also, I think most families definitely cancel you forever if you, if that happens. Like unless yeah. you have a very strong relationship with them and you've been with them through something maybe. I think most I families think right then and there. No, because like, they need you there for yeah. a specific thing. They're not there to coddle you. Yeah. And I think in general, that's kind of, the minute you're not solving something for a family, the minute you're not of service to them, uh, you're yeah, becoming a absolutely. liability. And that's usually it. 100%. 100%. It's what problem you're solving for them that like that your service should always be solving. Yeah. So you're working for the family uh, three days a week. Uh, what's your arrangement? Mm -hmm. Do you just bill them or is that is that like a, still a W-2 employment or? Um, no, I have my own like company and yeah. I uh, invoice them weekly. Nice. I, I think that's the, that's the nicest. Yeah, it's the best. It's the best. It's convenient for everyone. Um, I keep, and I have like several clients, so I keep credit cards on file. Everyone gets billed weekly and uh, groceries on top of service fee, uh, credit card processing fee, and I, it works out. Nice. So for somebody who 
were to start that in, the, in this year, 2024, how would you encourage them to grow from like, okay, you're a skilled restaurant chef, you're tired of having no money, you want to find your first couple of private clients in the way you do it, not a full-time client, how would you go about it? I would go about it with setting up a website. I have to say that like Squarespace is amazing for first-time people. It really does boost your SEO. You need a website. You need an Instagram page. You need to be selling yourself and showcasing your offerings. So make like four offerings, see what they are, contact. I don't know if you live in Manhattan, apartment buildings near you, office buildings near you, after school programs doulas, nurses, plastic surgeon offices. I think just promoting yourself. Very What is it about plastic surgeon uh, offices? Is it, is it disposable income if by the time you get to plastic well, it's, surgery? It's definitely, it's definitely disposable income. And these people are willing to spend lots of money to look good and yeah. to recover quickly. So if you offer them your services as like post recovery and how to heal faster and how to eat the right things post surgery, like it's a yeah. higher chance of being hired post plastic surgery than let's say post heart attack. Shockingly, yeah. After post heart attack, there is less chance of them hiring you for as a private chef to eat healthy than post plastic surgery. Ah, uh, shocking and not. True. Unfortunately, my my father in law had a heart attack. We tried to convince him of eating healthier. Uh, doesn't care. Yeah. So um, I, I can see why people that care for the looks might be more enticed to Absolutely. Eat, eat healthy. But I, I think, Julia, you, you really, um, you know how to play this because you just have to package your product right. It's all about the lines of we're cooking. You know, we're delivering nutritionist food. and But at the same time, you know how to go about it. Like, You will sell the same thing with a different packaging based on, okay, now we're talking to somebody who's recovering from the surgery, you know, but he, over here we have the athlete who is, needs peak performance for his games. Like, exactly. But it's the same thing. You're just yeah. calling it something different and attracting different audience members. Like I do, I've done virtual cooking classes. I've done in-person cooking classes. I've done kids cooking classes, but it's just getting those words even out into the Google universe yeah. and for those spiders to kind of read it and SEO friendly stuff that like, if you're trying, it will come. If you put it out there, you will get a bite. So I think the people who say they aren't, I think they're either not doing it right or too scared to try. But, yeah. And I think between, so earlier you mentioned the personality aspect. And now it's about putting yourself out there. You have to be really proactively push your services into the internet, you know, and kind of proactively approach all of those buildings. You have to be out there. You have to create a little bit of a brand. And I think this is where it gets scary for people who are focused on, oh, but I, I'm, I'm a good line cook. I'm a good sous chef. I'm a, maybe even a head chef, you know. But then suddenly I need to become a business person or like I need to sell myself. And I think it this is definitely daunting. And sometimes yeah. you don't need to, like, if you don't want to be out there on your own fully, there are services, there are other agencies that could, you know, handle some of the things for you. But if you want to optimize on all of your income, then you should be doing it kind of solo. And it is a little daunting and lonely at times, but when you find the right fit client they become family and it's like how you're, you're excited to go to work every day you know what i mean you're you're excited to serve them and help them and feed them and nourish them and it becomes exciting like you have so many different opportunities that can come your way in this field where i don't think that if you were like an office job nine to five or even in the back of the, of the kitchen like there aren't these opportunities as much as they are when it comes to like being a private chef Yeah. I find. Yeah. Well, one of my favorite, and that's from a personal perspective, is really to help somebody transform their health. Like I love to work with people who are dedicated about transformation. That's uh, something that really, I don't know, it's just for me personally, it strikes me so much more to enable somebody who, I mean, people that can afford us, many of them have a larger impact in the world. So if I can mm -hmm. enable somebody to be their best and go out there and transform something and impact 
the world ideally in in a regard that I would appreciate. But um, that is something I appreciate more than, for example, just cooking the next Thanksgiving dinner for 16 people. A hundred percent. Me too. And it's making them like feel better. Like a lot of my clients come to me with like chronic pain, illness. They don't know why this, they don't know why that. And like I myself too have like healed myself through food and people just like don't know that they're poisoning themselves from within and like just consuming like so many wrong things that aren't right for them. And like when you end up cooking the things they should be having and like you see them transform, like you said, and they're happier, they're healthier, they're more energized, they have more pep in their step. Like you did that. So you feel pride in like helping someone achieve that. Yeah. I guess they're, they're the tough part is you really need somebody who wants to do it. Mm -hmm. Some of the clients that call you, I'm like, oh, I, you know, I want to look better. I want to be skinny. I want to be healthy, but I don't want to eat all of that healthy food. And I actually want my burger, pizza, et cetera. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I find that a very tricky one usually because that's like, I mean, yes, you can imitate and you can work around and you can try to make it a bit more healthy and stuff. But I, I think for me personally, again, I love to work with the people who are dedicated and are willing to you know, eat the veggies and love the veggies. Because at yeah. least in my personal journey, I really became to love a veggie eater because I, one, I understood the benefits, but then I also discovered how to cook it. Like, for example, you can blandly boil uh, a broccoli and it will be a bit boring. Or you can, you know, roast it in the oven and char it a little bit so it gets like that aroma. And so there's ways to do that, which help you to build the gut microbiome and to be more healthy and but still be flavorful absolutely absolutely but i love that a lot of my clients come to me to be more plant forward and that's mm -hmm. my jam that's what i like love to do right like i ran a vegan restaurant for 10 years like i can make you vegan cheese and cashews it's gonna be amazing and protein forward like let's do it but i also am embracing the whole idea right now that my clients are trying to do more protein per meal and i'm like hmm, i need a little bit more protein per meal too let's figure this out so it's interesting like following their diet and their journeys and also like incorporating it into my new routine right because it's like if you cook a certain way three days a week at work it kind of transpires into your personal life yeah do you, do you feel like you've learned a lot like i mean some of your clients surely have doctors nutritionists that want to give mm -hmm. you insights and, and be part of the menu. Sorry for the interruption, but we gotta share the news with you. Nothing Fishy from FultonFishMarket.com They're delivering world-class seafood from New York City's legendary Fulton Fish Market straight to your door. Their fishmongers have helped countless chefs get what they need when they need it for over 200 years. Trusting FultonFishMarket.com means their experts work tirelessly to make your day run smoothly. Let your cooking skills shine and elevate your dishes with amazing seafood from FultonFishMarket.com. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm um, a certified health coach and I went to the Natural Gourmet, which is like a very like hippy dippy culinary program. So having my clients go from having all these food restrictions to vegan to now like more protein forward uh, and like researching and trying to get like when I was working for one client, I had to actually cook for his blood type. And the girlfriend was another blood type. So I had to cook specifically for her blood type. And then I tried it out for a few months and I did feel really good. And it actually taught me about how like um, my gut microbe is really sensitive to um, legumes. And it's like not the best for me. Um, okay. You have to un like unpack that... this a little bit. I, I'm pretty sure, including myself, mm -hmm. like how does this work? So you're giving your blood sample or a DNA sample? And then how do you so find out how to cook to your for your blood? blood? So apparently, so we have what, four or five blood types. So everybody has a blood type. So I'm B negative. Mm -hmm. um, my client was A positive and I think the girlfriend was O positive. So A positive is more like vegan. Um, they could do a lot of like fish, sardines, um, but animal meats were uh, more difficult to uh, digest for A negative blood types. And um, I think gluten and certain vegetables were harder to digest. I'm a B negative blood type, so I know that lamb, beans, legumes, chickpeas, all of that is really difficult for me to digest. And she was an O positive, so she was better off eating lots of um, 
gamey meats. So, yeah, you know, bison and lots of uh, kangaroo and all these like intricate meats that I had to like source for her. Whereas he was eating lots of tin fish and lots of vegetables, lots of bok choy, lots of beets, um, lots of fermented foods, lots of tempeh. So yeah. yeah, everyone there's, yeah, exactly. So there's different blood types and different things that people can eat. And I learned that along with my client and then I tried it out for a little bit. And I learned that like the things that through like elimination or reintroducing things, things that really didn't sit well with me or like causing me to have stomach issues. <laughs> level of effort high <laughs> very high they had to hire me to do it this is it really was interesting. definitely I've, a process i mean i've i've had some interesting clients but i've never heard about somebody who's who's going by that oh i've had another client who could only who was doing like a candida diet to like uh, make sure that she didn't have like a candida overgrowth in her gut everything had to be soaked everything had to be sprouted We had to sprout the beans, dry them, make them into flour, freeze the flour, ferment the flour, and then she could use the flour. <laughs> so it was like a five-day process just to make the flour. Oh, okay, now, um, now I would like to have a time machine go 50 years into the future and see who of those clients actually made a dent in their longevity and health span. A hundred percent, me too. I'm very curious. But I personally, so like I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's um, and I was told that I needed to remove gluten, dairy, eggs, nightshades, and caffeine, or not caffeine, coffee beans itself. And I have to say like, I'm, a, and I've always been a huge proponent of we are what we eat. Yeah. And I've been tested now every two months and every two, this has been like a six month journey so far. So I've had three tests um, and I've slowly been realizing like what to eliminate. And through the process of elimination, my test results have diminished like it was a very high number and now it's a very low number if that's not proof of like showing you that like we really are what we eat and we should be teaching our clients and our friends and our family to be a little bit more mindful of what they put into our body into their bodies yeah i mean if, if you literally look at it the body is made of the stuff we eat so mm -hmm. you know don't you want to give like let, let's think about a house And let's think you want to build a temple, like you want to take care of it and you want it to last for as long as it possibly can. You know, Absolutely. Don't, you, don't you want to eat the best ingredients that can make that happen, you know? and Well, that makes me, that is what I'm like questioning. People who have the means to pay for a private chef, why would you not want that versus going out to Carbone every night? Like, do you want to be fully canola oil like i i get it like new york city and all these amazing food cities have the best food in the world but you can't live off of that and be a healthy human on a daily basis like there needs to be a limit like you need to be ingesting healthy foods to have a proper life and actually enjoy all the money that you have but here's the thing i think it's a, a it's a loop so let's say somebody comes from no money and goes to money for them eating out at top restaurants is something that they're not used to so e initially that's like their form of having a rich life the mm. thing is they haven't yet explored that that actually leads to them feeling very low in energy and like tarjic and it doesn't get you the best version of who you can be uh, so Absolutely. you kind of have to go through that and notice I'm like okay i can afford all of this and it It's probably even tasty and all of that, but it doesn't get me to the best version of who I can be. And then if usually, it's, I feel like clients in their 50s, many of them, that's when it kicks in because now they have children who are growing up. And then if they kind of look into their future, they see potentially grandchildren. And that's when it kicks in mentally. I'm like, wait, I want to be there for those grandchildren. Like, And, and I think, by the way, one of the reasons we're, we're seeing a lot more uh, why people want protein-enriched diets these days is because of Peter Thiel's work. And he just published his book on longevity, where he's a lot of emphasis yeah. on, on more protein. But also on a, for men, yes, 100% agree with you. But the, also the switch to more protein for women specifically is hormone health. And it's because like so many women are being diagnosed with PCOS, endometriosis, Hashimoto's, so many things because we've been in a diet culture for so long. And women have been in a 
protein deficit. And it's now affecting our reproductive hormones, our periods, our skin, our hair, so many different things. So what would you recommend for a woman? Let's say you have a new client and you're kind of guiding her through this. How much protein per pound of body weight would you recommend? Well, I would say 30, 30 to 40 grams per meal. Per meal. Okay. And that, that's for somebody who has two or three meals a day? Three. So, okay, so we're like 60 to 90, yeah. Shouldn't it, okay. it, should, it should be like one, uh, one gram of protein to one pound of body weight. Like, like there, if you're 150 yeah. pounds divided by three, and that's how much you should be getting in protein per meal kind of thing. Yeah. Then and look, be, I'm not be, perfect. Yeah. It's really hard to get that much protein in sometimes, especially when like my plate is like so veggie forward. Yeah. But I have noticed that I sleep better. Uh, my digestion is better. My skin is better. My hair is better. My uh, mental health, anxiety, like there's just so many factors that play into what we eat. And it's just unfortunate that women for so long have been fed low carb, low fat, um, all of these high processed foods well, that question. are affecting us long term. You said you feel better, but you said it right after planned forward is it you feel better because you're planned forward or because you upped your protein game uh both 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 i think i upped my protein game i eliminated my gluten um you know like i, I stopped doing dairy and gluten and eggs and tomatoes and peppers and white potatoes and coffee like there are certain things that i didn't that i was ingesting on a daily basis that was making me sick and now that i like and healthy things right like tomatoes and peppers and things that are relatively very healthy and high in vitamin c and potassium and so many different things and they were making me sick without even knowing hmm. i mean that that sounds like a journey to get to that micro level of distinction I'm like okay peppers no and not just nightshades but now we're at the tomato you know and then you're like a hundred percent it's definitely a process and My one client that I've been with now for five years, she's allergic to tomatoes, cherries, strawberries, raspberries, dairy. Like, so, so like, I think because I'm so used to people not being able to eat certain things and like being on that journey with them, that I think it's so fun to take that journey. Like, why wouldn't we all want to know what is optimal for our most best feeling selves? Yeah, I think in theory, yes. Why don't we all want to be healthy and wealthy, you know? And but it's the same. Like why? What? Like if you if you actually look at how most people prefer for retirement, it's it's similar with health. It's kind of a neglected process. And I think it's Until those Chile. it's those things. Humans will always take the pill before they put in the effort. Like they they will opt the majority of people will opt for the surgery before they put in the effort. Even uh -huh. if it's fixable or, the, or with effort itself, without expense, especially if the health insurance picks up the bill, uh, people are more likely to go into surgery than actually just do something about it. Or Ozempic. Yeah, that's the, that's the best example. So I, I think that uh, in, in this regard, you and many of our clients are a little bit of a rare breed who are proactive about like, hey, I actually want to feel great and I'm willing to put in the effort and go the extra mile and spend weeks, actually months in your case also, to make the distinction between how does this food versus this food impact my well-being? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And not a lot of people want to take on that responsibility and like do the work. But the people who do, I end up somehow finding them and we work well together. Yeah. But I also want to emphasize these people infinitely happy to have people like you and also me who are a little bit personal, not when it comes to health, you know, who go down that rabbit hole out of their own interest. Like every yeah. time I find a client or the client finds me and they're like, oh, there's, there's like out of these 10,000 private chefs that we could maybe hire there is a person who actually cares about this already. So there is some 100%, magic in I, that. A hundred percent. I got hired to do a clean dinner party for um, uh, Mona Van. She's like a clean, like health and wellness fit, uh, influencer. And 
it was so interesting cooking for her because she's like, okay, I am use this oil and this oil. I'm like, me too. And she was like, how do you like, can we have the recipes for this? And can you make an almond cream? And can you do this and this? And I was like, yeah, that's how I like, it was just very refreshing that that was exactly my style of cooking. And that's exactly what she wanted. Yeah. So it was a very like, you know, we did an Italian dinner and instead of breadcrumbs, it was cauliflower crumbs on the chicken. And instead of noodles, it was kelp noodles. Um, so when the client aligns so well with you, it's very fun. Yeah. And this is something I always like to emphasize is every chef should try to find this match. And it's usually out there. Like there's chefs who want to go greasy and heavy and they want the short rib taco and there's clients for that. And then there is athletes out there who want, you know, protein rich and different kind of, and, and that's on different spectrums. You can have that in vegan, you can have that keto and, and, and they actually appreciate it. If you yourself have that level of expertise based on you going down that rabbit hole yourself. A hundred percent. I, I always kind of keep repeating myself because I think it's so important. Don't, remain stuck in one position just because you think, you know, you need the paycheck and now you, you, I, maybe in the beginning, if you want to get the foot in the door, you know, stick around a little bit till you have a reasonable amount of time and money and all of that, but then try to find the families and the clients that just live life the way you would live it for yourself. And then you can serve them accordingly. A hundred percent. And also don't be discouraged if it doesn't work out, if they let you go. Like they did you a favor, yeah. move on to the next one that is the right fit for you. Yeah. Like I, like it's like dating, right? Like you have to like <laughs> kiss a couple of frogs before you find the right one. And that's how it works with the clients. So maybe, maybe we should make a, a Cinder app, chef. A dating can, app. <laughs> and then clients and chefs can, the problem is it's actually, it's probably the same ratio. There's like 10,000 men for one woman. And then that's yeah, one, exactly. one client and 10,000 chefs. <laughs> exactly. The odds aren't good. It's like New York City dating. Yeah. So uh, how do you feel about New York is such a vibrant market, you know, like what you and me are doing in, in, in New York is New York at the end of the day. It has the most billionaires in the world. It has is a city with the highest density or one of the highest densities of millionaires in the world. It's it's where we can thrive. Do you ever think about leaving New York or? Um, no. <laughs> Fair enough. And yes, I mean yes, I've definitely thought about it. I just love New York so much, and my family is here, and it's I, I haven't really, I've never thought about leaving, but I do think that there is a market outside of New York as well. Um, there are major athletes all across the country. Nutrition is calling, begging for private chefs to prepare these athletes' meals. There are celebs across the country. There are rich people across the country. Like, there, yes, there are more rich people in New York, but there are more people with expendable income in other places in America as well, where yeah. they're willing to have a chef. And your cost of living is less. Groceries are less. Um, and maybe your quality of life is even better. Like, in order to maintain a good quality of life in Manhattan or in New York and be a private chef, like it's grueling work. It's long hours. It's definitely like you have to have skin in the game. Um, and if you want a more laid back, more calm, more not restaurant line cook job, but also not uh, go, go, go. Everything's on you because you're the only one in charge kind of thing. I think moving to a secondary city like Philly, Chicago, San Fran, like there are people with money who will pay you. <laughs> San Fran is a secondary chef. city. Don't, don't let people hear that. Well, over there. <laughs> it's not a secondary city. You're right. But it's not LA. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, so it's not. Okay. You're right. Chicago, Philly. What's another secondary city? Seattle. <laughs> yeah. Vegas. Um, I have a friend who left New York in the COVID and moved to Vermont. And with my help has a thriving private chef business. She has, you know, um, three weekly clients that she does a drop off for and one client that she sees twice a week in home. 
and it's the perfect balance, you know, three, like it, she has her kitchen certified in Vermont. She cooks for these three clients in home. And then the other two days is in, in the client, in the other client's home, preparing them breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And it's like right. the perfect happy medium for her. And she's yeah. making exactly what she would have made in New York, but her cost of living is significantly less. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's, that's good. Um, if you can maintain the New York salaries or charge, that's, mm -hmm. I, I think most regions, there's a bit of a drop there. Uh, it's not quite the same as it is in New York city and in the Hamptons. It's not, but also yeah. like there's New York prices, but then there's Hamptons prices and that is just make believe money. That yeah. is just monopoly money. Like the things that you can get away with in the Hamptons is just absurd. And it's just like a small three month window. Like some people can just go and be a chef in the Hamptons for the summer and like make enough for the year. Yeah. Because it is that silly. Yep. That's the Hamptons. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they can charge $30 for like a 16 ounce guacamole. Yeah. I, but I mean, that that's also the, the downside of being there throughout the summer you, you know even if you make good money and you go to like you go anywhere in the Hamptons and you just try to have a little bit of a good time in your time off and you're like this is crazy <laughs> oh yeah 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 don't spend on your money don't go out wait until the summer's over or like go to like West Hampton or go yeah. to you know Quag like go outside of the Hamptons <laughs> it's, it's actually it's probably cheaper if you get a get the weekend off or get two days off, fly to Mexico, flight will be a good expense. And then you can just have a ball and you come back. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. It'll still be cheaper than the Hamptons. Yeah. Well, Julia, so what, what's next for you in the, in the culinary landscape? What, what are you working on? What, what's your dream for the next five years of your career? You know what? I don't know specifically. I know that I definitely want to see what else is out there in the media and food space, kind of do maybe another show, compete again. Um, I find this to be so fun and exciting. So I love that experience. But I feel like I'm trying to figure out the next steps. And I thought it would be in, you know, growing my private chef agency and kind of having more chefs that kind of work under me and I send them out to clients that wasn't making me happy. And I was very much so on the verge of burnout again by doing yeah. that. And I think that my next venture could potentially be more on the coaching side of things. Like I have so many years of experience and so many different facets within the food space um, you know, restaurant, private chef, agency, TV, media, social media, where I want to see how I could help other chefs kind of get their bearings, get started in this world, in this private chef realm, I guess, and how to really optimize them being a one man or one woman show and having this like solo entrepreneur experience as yeah. a private chef. Basically accelerate the journey. Yeah. Like I've done all the mistakes. Let me help you so you don't have to do them. Yeah. In a nutshell, that's kind of why, why I started the podcast because I felt like when I came to New York, I was working for minimum wage at one of the best restaurants in the world. And I was like, the journey to six figures was hard. You know, I'm like, I had to, yeah. I had to figure it all out. I'm like, if I can turn around and just share all my wisdom and the wisdom of all the guests combined and, and just hand it to the next generation of chefs. Like if, if, if just one person doesn't have to struggle for five years, you know, and can do it maybe in a month. Absolutely. And we've already had a lot more than one person by now, but it's, I'm not sure if Leah is still listening, but we, we used to have a monthly meetup and one day Leah joined us and, um, She, she was very unhappy. She had an underpaid job in the city itself. And we were like, you're grossly underpaid. And, you know, we, we, we just helped her a little bit, connected her a little bit. And she, within the spectrum of the community of chefs, realized that there is different jobs, different potential. And, and, and I think she transitioned quite well for herself. And, and I think that, that those are those moments where I just feel like this, it's all this, why this is worthwhile. 
A hundred percent. And it's not like we're reinventing the wheel, right? Like we figured it out. Let us help you. Like, I feel like it's so isolating and so solo where people are afraid that you're going to take my client. If I tell you how much I charge or you're going to take this away from me. If I tell you this, it's like, no, there's plenty to go around. Like, you know how, like we live in New York city. There's 10 million people here. Like I'm not taking your client. I'm, I'm here to help you. Like I've done the mistakes. Like I'm trying to help you not make them. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> you're taking my clients yeah um, that might very well be but there's more that's the thing exactly and i feel like there's sometimes people who are coming at it from um the wrong mentality or like a different perspective and i think that people are out to get them when they're really trying to help so i i feel like when they're doing it all on their own they're worried but i feel like we need to be a community more yeah I, because I, it's I, such an isolating position it is and it, yeah it's And the reality is people outside the industry can't relate. Yes, that is true. They don't even know what you're talking about half the time. (laughs) Yeah, because it's such a strange thing. It's, it's, I mean, I understand Mm -hmm. why, why people can't relate to it, but yeah, this is why I appreciate that. So having said all of that, where can people connect with you? Instagram. Um, and I do a weekly sub stack where I post either recipes or tips and tricks. Um, but everything is mainly on my website and Instagram and I'm health chef Julia on every platform. I like if that. You just type consistent. in health chef Julia, I'll come up. <laughs> health chef Julia on all platforms. <laughs> yeah. See, but this is all part of the game. Like you make it sound so easy. It's like, yeah, you know, and I just have the same name everywhere and I know how to package <laughs> I mean, it. Yes, and, like, but it's like decade. There's so much experience to get it down to this. Yeah. I'm like, okay, yes, I know I have to be consistent and my branding has to be consistent. And I know I'm advertising like this to the athlete and I'm advertising like this to the healthy family and I'm advertising like this to yes. the person recovering. Yeah. And I have to say that I've been very fortunate that my years of experience, everyone has kept coming back. Everyone has repeat clientele. Even years from when I first started, I did an event with a doctor at NYU about salmon. Last week, I did another event for them. And there was eight years in between. Do you know what I mean? So like, I think that we need to, and he was a doctor and he was a plastic surgeon. (laughs) And he was all of these things that I, that I have learned along the way. And have realized that those are the niche places to look for and reach out to and really hone in on yeah. in this field. And I, and I think it takes raving fans. Like you have to deliver on a consistent basis and, and like, you know, um, really. You have to deliver in food, but also personality. Like we yeah, said, yeah, like yeah on, all, like on all ends of, that, of the experience. Yes. And I think if you if you don't have raving fans, you don't have a business. I completely agree, because it still is word of mouth at the end of the day. Yeah, and and um, nobody nobody will call you back years later if they didn't feel like you've killed it, or it's like then you will get those one off calls where somebody doesn't know how to find a new chef phone number, you know. But <laughs> the reality is, and yeah. I've had I had one client years ago who found me on Instagram. And that, this was seven, eight years ago. I've now probably done three parties for her a year since. I've cooked for her daughter, her daughter-in-law, her daughter's like influencer friends. Like when you make that connection, you are part of the family. You are in in indoctrine, indoctrine. What's the word? No, in, indoctrination is uh, different. That's when I give my belief system into you. <laughs> Yes, yes, you're not, I'm not that. I'm, I'm flanking on the word, but I was like adopted in and it's wonderful. And it's just, again, like you have to deliver on food, but you have to also deliver on showing up on time, being clean, being cheery, not being a Debbie Downer. Like just your energy has to talk through your food and your ability to kind of sway the room and talk to the room. Yeah. You know, I was at the state management conference just uh the weekend before and they were speaking about how uh you know big big hotel companies like marriott trains their staff to be very consistent in experience like let's say between you entering the hotel to actually being on your room you might have probably interacted with six people one somebody's mm-hmm. opening your uh, opening the car door you know somebody's taking your luggage somebody's bringing you to the reception receptionist 
all of those individual interactions. And if if they don't, if they're not consistent in terms of pleasantness, you will immediately remember. And and it's it's, it's sim- similar with us, you know, if we go into somebody's home nine times, even if it's and if if just one is off, then that that might be kind of the nail in the coffin. The, yep. The straw that broke the camel's back. Absolutely. And there's so many people and so many chefs that I met and I try their food and it's amazing. And then I have a conversation with them and I'm like, I don't want to even like have a conversation. Like you're not pleasant to be around. Your energy yeah. is very down and dark and you're not um, g- giving me the type of energy I want to be around or the type of food that I want to eat. Unfortunately, even though it's amazing, it's not something that I'd probably want to be around on a daily basis in my home. So what are those chefs supposed to do now that you refine it like that? <laughs> um, they need to get out of their shell a little bit, embrace, you know, a cheery disposition occasionally. Um, but there's always a client out for everyone. There's always a client out there that doesn't want you to talk to them, that yeah. wants you to be, you know, a little bit grumpy, a little bit moody. They they enjoy that. There's it's like dating, you know, like I just said, like yeah. everybody likes a little bit of an emotional mind fuck and that's <laughs> I mean there's also clients who will just literally put you in the kitchen and don't want to see you. And never speak. I had a client fly me out to cook on their yacht and they had me go to Whole Foods and purchase already cooked rotisserie chicken and already pre-made barbecue sauce. They paid me a lot of money and flew me down. And all I did was make barbecue chicken wraps on a George Foreman grill in their yacht that they didn't even sleep in. I slept on the yacht. Those jobs are out there, yeah. Yeah. So, and I was miserable, but there would be someone who would be like, yes, this is amazing. I got paid so much money just to make these stupid wraps. And I was like miserable because I wasn't able to like create or make like, you know, do something that made me happy. Yeah. Pulling apart an already cooked rotisserie chicken was not for me. Well, and there will be chefs who will pick pick up that check. And initially they might think it's cool, but I, I think we all need to get down to what fulfills and, you know, what drives A hundred percent, a hundred percent, because you will still be miserable in a high paying private chef position with the wrong fit. That's for sure. Well, Julia, thank you so much for your time. I think this has been thank entertaining you so much. at the same time <laughs> educational. So thank you so much thank for taking you. the time. Thank you so much for having me. We'd like to thank our sponsor, FultonFishMarket.com, the best seafood in the nation, trusted by the best chefs in the world. Aside from offering premium seafood, they also make life easier for you by delivering all these outstanding products right to your doorstep. Visit the official website www.fultonfishmarket.com and explore the incredible selection of seafood and let your clients experience quality that has captivated palates for generations. Use code PRIVATECHEF at checkout to get 15% of your first order. When it comes to seafood, fultonfishmarket.com is the name we trust. Thank you for joining us at the Private Chef Podcast. If you know any highly skilled chefs that want to take their life to the next level, Make sure to share this podcast with them. And if you enjoyed this episode, click subscribe and check out our upcoming episodes. Thank you for listening.